Since the upload of my video on curling curves, I've gotten a fair amount of questions regarding ways to modify or add on to the setup to create stylistic variations of the effect. So I have compiled a couple of those questions, and in this video, I will go through them one by one and give answers and solutions to the best of my ability. And in the end, I hope we can all walk away from this video with a bit more knowledge than before. So let's get into it. Get to the Shapa wonders why in 3.2, the set handle positions part of the setup doesn't do anything. And the answer to that is that it seems that the day after me uploading the video, Blender released an update to 3.2 that, well, just broke that part. It's just something that we have to accept if we are using the alpha or beta versions of Blender. Chances are that this will be fixed in the near future, but I would like to take the opportunity to show an alternative to the set handle positions approach that gives a pretty nice result with just a single node. And that node is called set handle type. The set handle type only works if you have set the spline type to Bezier, since it's the only type of curve that has handles, and it provides a couple of different options. For example, vector type handles basically aligns each handle exactly to the curve on both sides of the control points, which creates sharp corners. And free allows you to adjust each handle separately. However, for a quick and easy smoothing of the curves, we can just set the type to auto. This automatically calculates the length and direction for the handles that will ensure the smoothest result, and it saves us the trouble of smoothing out the curves ourselves. Sabolch asks if it's possible to use this setup with a rigged and or animated mesh, and the answer is yes. With a few caveats, of course. The main drawback of the system in this context is that while the points are calculated based on the topology of the mesh, and therefore largely maintains the distribution while the mesh is animating, the noise texture that we apply to the curve to create the curling is not, but is instead calculated based on the current positions of the points and vertices relative to the object itself. One way to kind of fix this issue, at the cost of fine control of the noise, is to replace the noise texture with a random value node set to vector, and use that as a noise instead. And in order to adjust the size of the random noise, we can use a vector math node set to scale before the set position node. That way we at least maintain some control over the curling. Mankun tried to randomize the colors of each curve by using the same technique that Blender Guru uses in his donut tutorials to randomly assign colors to the sprinkles. But unfortunately, geometry that is created within a geometry node's node tree doesn't really function in the same way as geometry that has been created outside of the node tree and then used within it. The random color trick works on mesh primitives created in a node tree. However, in the case of the curling curves, we don't actually create the faces of the geometry until the very end, and at that point they are pretty much considered to be part of a single mesh. So while it's not as simple as using a random value of an object info node in a shader, it is still possible to randomly assign colors to the curves, because even though the curves are considered to be part of a single mesh, they are still considered to be individual curves within a node tree. And luckily for us, there are ways to transfer that information from the Yomdenot's tree to the shader. And here is how. First, we want to capture the indices of the individual curves by using a capture attribute node right after we instance the mesh lines. Index values are integers, so we set the data type to integer. And since the mesh lines at this stage of the tree are just instances, we set the domain to instance. And of course, the value that we want to capture is the index values. So the capture attribute now captures and stores the indices of each individual line, which we can use in the next step. What we want to do next is to limit the amount of possible index values, and in extension the amount of possible colors, that we want to work with in the shader. By adding a math node set to modulo, we can specify that limit by setting it as the bottom value. This creates a looping value range from 0 to the specified value minus 1. Which means that in my case, we have converted the captured index range of 0 to the amount of instances to a new repeating range of 0 to 3, which in total gives us a limit of 4 possible values and colors. Next, we want to modify our new range to fit inside a range of values from 0 to 1, and we do that with a map range node. The reason for why we want the final range to be between 0 and 1 is because it makes it much easier for us to use in the shader. The only value we need to change in a map range node is the from max value, and the value that we use here is the mod value minus 1. Because, as I said before, the module node in this case outputs a range between 0 and 3. The next step is to transfer our newly created index range from the node tree to the shader. And to do that, we first connect the map range node to an empty socket of the group output. I'm going to press N to open the property sidebar and rename this new output to random color. 
Now if we look at the modifiers tab, there is a new field under the output attributes. And in this field we can give the attribute a name that we can reference in the shader. Just make sure that it isn't a name that is already visible in the dropdown of the field. Before we move over to the shading workspace, create a material in the materials tab. And assign it to the mesh in a node tree by adding a set material node. And selecting the material in a dropdown. Over in the shading workspace, we only really need two nodes. An attribute node and a color ramp. Connect them like this. And in the name field, type in the name that you specified in the geometry nodes modifier. Now all you have to do is add some colors in the color ramp and adjust the positions of the color stops. Just keep in mind that the amount of colors you can use and the positions of the color stops are dependent on the value you set in the modular node. One of my Patreon patrons, Michael Arney from Halftone asked, is it possible to modify the setup to create something like a nerve-like structure? And after some tweaking, this is what I came up with. So let's go through the setup and modifications to see how it works. Firstly, the scene setup consists of one instance of the mesh with the original node tree, one instance of the mesh with the modified node tree, and one instance without the geometry modifier at all. The non-modifier mesh is used in the modified node tree as the target geometry of a raycast node. They use the normals of the mesh as the ray direction and I use the hit distance output in combination with the compare node to tell the distribute points node which faces to distribute points on. In this case, any face that is facing another face and is within 5 meters of that face will not be used to distribute points on. I then use the normals of the original mesh in combination with some boolean math nodes to further limit where points should be distributed. So in this case, if the C component of a face's normal is greater than negative 1, meaning that it is not pointing down, and also less than positive 1, meaning that it is not pointing up, we can distribute points on it. The result of this is that we are only using faces that are pointing sideways, and are not pointing towards other faces, as the faces to distribute points on. In the original setup we set the c-scale of the instance on points node to negative 1, to make the lines point inwards. So if we change that back to 1, the lines will point outwards again. Also, since we don't want to delete any lines or points anymore, we can just remove this raycast part, which was only there to delete points that ended up outside of the mesh. As a final touch, I made the lines gradually level out at the ground position as they extend away from the base mesh, since I thought it looked more organic that way. The way it works is that I take the distance from the faces of the base mesh and each of the points of the curves. And I then remap the distance values using a map range node so that I get a range of 1 to 0. I then take that value and use it as a factor of a float curve node, where I can essentially draw using the handles in the node until I get a gradient fall off that I like. I then use the resulting values of the float curve node as the new C positions of the points along the curves with the set position node. And that's about it. I hope this follow-up video gave you some new insights into how the system works, and that you learned something new. See you next time.